Okay, so we've got our main program all set to go. What do you want to do with the to-do list? So let's just do, let's start this thing out by writing basically inside out loop. Let's just think of what we would do for the first one and then we'll generalize it to a bunch of them. So if it were just one entry, what would you want to do? <coughs> Pardon me? Check for me? How are you going to grab the information? Like the, the information is sitting on the stack right now that starts the process on the to-do list. So let's go grab one thing off of the to-do list. So let's grab whatever clearing happens to be on the to-do list. Then what? get has beer we'd probably just print out a message let's just do it that way it's the main program so we can print And I guess if we're going to print out the information from current, we should add a two string into the clearing. Um, something like that. So we'll just convert it, the identifier to a string and send it back. And uh, we'd be done. What if it wasn't the place that had beer? Then you want to check to see if there are other What did we say we did after we erased this one, which is what we've done so far? We've now got that in current, so the to do list is empty. So, what's the next step? I did this one, the zero one. There was no beer there. So take everything that's a, that I can get to from zero, which is the one, two, and three, and dump them on to the to-do list. Okay. So the to-do list is going to end up with a one, two, and a three next as the things that we need to do. So what words would you use to describe doing that? Give me a phrase. Three, just three or four words of what we're attempting to do there. Just the idea. We'd add a bunch of stuff to the to-do list. I'm going to call it, maybe instead of that, I'm going to call it push all connecting paths. Uh, maybe a better idea okay and then we'd be done one of them you want to do that a bunch of times so if we were to do that a bunch of times we would end up with code that looked more or less like that What's the reason for stopping? Here. 
There's actually two reasons for stopping. So uh, either there was no beer, which would be a sad thing, or you found the beer. Okay, which one of those? This is where the temptation is to say, well, it's while I haven't found beer and there's something still remaining to check. And you know how I feel about writing an and at this point. So which one of those things is more important? Uh, sad to say, no. Finding the beer isn't the isn't the really important thing. Let's play the game the other way. Uh, suppose that uh, uh, your friends wanted to play a trick on you. What would they do at this point if you were going and about to play the game? They didn't hide. They didn't hide any beer, and they were just fooling you. Ah ha ha! You were going to go play this game, and we really didn't have any money for any. So the condition here is whether or not there's anything on the to-do list and we'll worry about what happens for the exceptional case later. Okay? So this thing becomes while to-do dot size is greater than zero. So that's all we're going to worry about whether or not we have something to check and the exceptional condition is Oh, oh my God, we found some beer someplace, and that will cause us to do something special. Okay? So this is this idea. Don't worry about trying to think of all of the possibilities there. Just pick the most important one in order to make it work. Okay? Well, push all connecting paths. I don't know what that does, so just to get the syntax errors out of it, I'm going to write private void. It's probably got to be static in main. Push all paths, push all connecting paths. Something like that. Okay, and we'll just run source format to make it look beautiful. So there's the general idea, and if we found beer now, that's the exceptional condition, so that will cause us to stop. Okay, and so notice I didn't have to write an and I somehow found the beer. Worst case, I mean, we've already got the information printed out. Okay. So now that we've got that done, notice how simple that main program is? And part of the simplicity is saying, all I have to worry about is I'm going to somehow have to go find all of the things that are connecting and somehow get set up for next time. And I didn't worry about how that's done. So that's another trick. As soon as you find yourself doing a lot of, oh, I'm going to worry about all the details of something, that's probably a good idea to just get the general idea, give that a method name, and then worry about it later. Okay. So now we have to worry about pushing all connecting paths. Here's another little trick. What information do you need in order to play that game? You need the current clearing and anything else? You need all, well, you need the to do list so that you can place things onto the to do list. Anything else? One other piece of information we're going to need, even though we've already sort of got it. all clearings. Now, one of the things here is you could notice that all clearings is essentially what we would call a global variable. 
But the joy of this is that if you do it this way, you're telling people those are the three pieces of information I need in order to accomplish this task. That's the only thing that I'm going to use. So it has the advantage of telling people what you're planning on working with so you're not just picking things out of thin air someplace. Or in this case, two of them from local variables and another one from a global or whatever it happened to be, something along that line, right? They're not all coming from different places. Here's the three things I need. The other joy of that is that eventually if you want to test that thing, you have a way of, since it's a method, of writing a unit test to test it, okay? And if it's not a method, you can't test it. Okay, so it helps set your brain. And so then the trick is you can just pick these things, use exactly the same names that you used before because that's not going to hurt. So I'm just going to grab exactly those things there. And I'm going to put in their, uh, their definitions. So this one was a clearing. The next thing, the to-do list, you can actually just go steal it. There's what the to-do list is. And the last one is all clearings, which is a uh, clearing array. Okay, so now we can just concentrate with the information we've got. What do you need to do? You need to get uh, the clearings connected to the current clearing. Okay, so clearing the information that we need to get is all of the connections. So let's just write, throw in a getter there. So get connections is going to return connections. And there's, this is a static array, so it really doesn't matter if we return the actual thing. And that thing is just a list of numbers. Okay. So now we'll go into the main program and we'll say integer array connections is talk to current dot get connections to retrieve it. Now what? Say it in English first. Yeah. Add the connections to the to do list. Or the magic words, not just add, but want to do more than one of them. So go through all of the connections. What do you use to go through all of the connections? For each. for each would be a happy thing. So that's for what kind of thing is that going to be? If this is a connection in connections, what type of thing is a connection? Oh look, it magically works. Notice that the, there's actually a, a weird conversion probably taking place there, but we won't worry about it. The for each is going to work to go and retrieve those things. So let's go through all of the connections and do what with them? Push them onto a stack. So that would be uh, to-do list dot push. And if you try to push a connection, doesn't like it. Why doesn't it like it? The wrong type. Yeah. Is there integers instead of clearings? So we've got integers, but we need clearings. So we need to give a connection to the array. So all clearings is the array. And 
and that array is indexed by integer values. Okay, so I was slow so that you got the logic behind that, the conversions. So all clearings is an array, so we're going to use the integer value that we stored as an index into the correct position into the array in order to retrieve the values. Okay. Is that it? Really? Let's just do one more thing here. Let's just print out uh, current clearing. Just so that we can see it actually doing something. And we'll run it and see what happens. So there's what it prints out. So we're starting at zero. Then we went to three. Then we went to nine. Then we went really back to three, up to eight, back to zero, up to two, did seven came back to zero, did one, did six, did 11, and found fear. Isn't that sort of interesting? We took this problem when you started it, and you looked at it, and you said, oh, this is just a bunch of wacky if-then-else's, and it's going to be hard to turn into something that was reasonably general. And there's the entire bit of code that goes and finds the beer as an algorithm. It's really pretty straightforward once you have the idea that the stack is keeping track of all of the things that you haven't gotten to yet, right? So here's this idea for a stack that you're at this one and you've got more than one thing to do. So if you've got more than one thing to do, the trick is to say, well, I'll use the stack to keep track of all of the ones that I haven't done yet. Just keep throwing them on the stack, and then we can eventually go and pick them off. Because you can, your code can only choose one of those possibilities at a time. OK, so there's, there's uh, current. And that's really all of the working code to get it started. Just for fun, let's move the beer someplace else. So if we move the beer to, where do you want it? Five. Any place, we'll give it a try. See whether or not it finds the beer. Clearing five. So there's your list of all of the places it stopped at along the way in order to find it. Okay. So it looks like it finds beer. I'm just going to put it back to 11 so that we can stick with the diagram we've got. Now, there's the basic code. We managed to find beer wherever it happens to be in the forest. But the problem with this thing is that it's only calling out the things that it's visiting. And it's not calling out, oh, I'm at 9, I'm going back to 3, I'm going over to 8. And I'd like it to also describe exactly where it's going along the way. OK? So start this thing again. What was the trick yeah. for clearing zero? Instead of popping them, just mark them as visited. Just, just mark them. Leave that little breadcrumb there that says, oh, OK, that's part of where I am right now. And then take all of the other ones that you can get to and put them onto the stack. Okay? So we need to somehow be able to mark clearings to say whether or not we've been there before. So we'll go into the clearing class, and we need to add a Boolean. What do you want to call it? Is it explored? 
visited, checked, checked works, checked, marked, anything like that. Okay, so we'll add in uh, uh, public Boolean was checked. say that it was checked and then we need the setter yeah is checked was checked sure and we'll write uh, public void checked we can play with the names later um, and if it was checked, it says uh, checked equals. Uh, just for fun, let's put in, just in case we have to uncheck them. That way you can set it to anything you want. So you can set it to true or false. And it should start out as checked equals false. Okay. So now what happens to this code? What happens after you pop something? Well, you shouldn't pop it. Instead, you should check it. Yeah. Let's just, you got two choices here. You can, you can, you know, peek and then use peek to go and change it and leave it on the stack, or you can remove it and then put it back on. Any preference? Yeah, I think so. uh, okay, let's change this to peek so that we've looked at it. I suppose that Uh, we'll, we'll try it either way, right? We'll try it this way and just we'll just see what happens. So this is current dot checked is true. So we'll mark it right away. And if we've found beer, we're basically done. And then we'll push all of the connecting paths. So we've got it marked. So we haven't removed it. We push one, two, and three onto the stack. At some point, we come along and we mark three. So we've done zero and three. And then at some point, we come along and go, OK, there's no beer at three. So we'll do nine. And then we end up checking nine and not finding any beer. Okay. So this is what the stack looks like at some point. The next time we come around not having found any beer, we're going to check nine again and not find any beer. Then we're going to check nine again and not find any beer because we're only peeking at it. So we've just created an infinite loop. So what should happen if you find a checked one, just throw it away. Been there, done that, don't care anymore. Okay, so we'll do a peak, and if current dot is checked is true, that's a special case, what are you going to do? So that's to do dot pop, specifically not caring to save it, and then don't want to fall through. It's a special <coughs> case. Break. Break would stop the loop, but we want to go back up and do it again. Okay. So notice I'm following my tradition of 
still playing that game of anything that's special, just try to do a shortcut and bring it back up to the top. So whether that be, it's the same sort of thing we've been doing with methods, but now we're playing the same game within loops to try to force it to go back up and do it again. Okay, think it still works? Hopefully. Still works. Okay, so it looks like the modifications we've made at least haven't broken it. Okay, so now we've got it, so it's putting the marks in. How do you know when you're going backwards? We need to print something out because there's, there's nothing in here that's currently printing anything out that says anything about moving backwards. So in this case, how did you know you were moving backwards? If you pop something to mark Okay, so if we've seen nine, we take that one off, which one are you going back to? Three. Three, okay. If we were at three and we take that one off, which one are we going back to? Zero. Zero. So the answer to the question of which one we're going back to is it's always go down through the stack and find the last marked one other than the one we just took off. So we take one off and then we go backwards looking for something. Okay. So there's the point where we've taken one off. So this is the point where we print going back to. Okay. What information do you need to figure out that you're going back to? Uh, you need the to-do list. You need just the to-do list is all of the information you need. Okay, because the stack is all that we looked at in order to solve that problem. Okay, so that means we'll go down here and we'll write private static void print going back to, and we're going to use the stack of clearings, which was um, the to do list. takes care of all the syntax errors. Okay, so here's our stack. We've removed, we'll play this game because it's easier to see. We were at three and now we have to find the last mark one. What are you gonna use to go through this thing? The loop. You need a loop to go through it. Well, what about a for each? Well, it doesn't matter because you don't, I mean, you can stop the for each early, so it's okay. Okay. Which direction is the for each going to take you through the stack? If you were writing the code and this was a linked list of things on this stack, what direction would you be going through it? To the, uh, like this would be the first thing on the chain, that would be the second, that would be the third. So the most convenient thing if you were had an iterator running through this and it was a chain list like we've been doing, is you would start from this direction. Even if it was an array, and this is the zero position in the array, chances are pretty good that the iterator is going through this way rather than going from the endmost ones backwards. Okay, so using an iterator isn't gonna do us any good. So if this was a pile of newspapers and you wanted to work your way backwards through it, what would you do? Take the first one off the pile of newspapers 
set it aside, take the second one off, set it on top of the one that you just done, take the third one until eventually you'd reach the point where you'd found the one that you were looking for. And then put them all back. And then you'd have to go and put them all back again to get them all back onto the top of the, onto this thing just like it was. Okay? That's one way of doing it. Is there another way of doing it rather than putting it all back? You could just peel them off and peek. How about copying it? The other option is to copy this <coughs> thing, make a copy and destroy the copy. Okay? And then you don't care anymore. You can just keep throwing them off and popping them until you find the one that you want. And the joy of doing the copy operation is that you don't have to worry about this when it's still in its proper state. Okay. Now the question is, which one of those is, is more efficient? Let's assume this forest was really, really, really big. Should you copy or should you just pop? You should just pop that. Should probably just pop because if you just pop, chances are pretty good the one that you want that's marked is just barely down through the pile and it's not the bottommost one, right? Versus if you copy this thing and you've got lots to copy, you're doing this big, huge copy operation only to take the top one or two items off of it, okay? So probably the best option in this case, if we assume that there's gonna be a large forest, is to take them off onto a separate pile and then put them back again, okay? So let's play the game that way. So we'll need another stack of clearings that's the saved stuff. So there's our stack. Now what? Have to go through everything that's in that pile. So that's, can't use a for each because it might go in the wrong direction. So we'll make a clearing variable current, probably have to set it to null just to make life good. Wow, save dot size is greater than zero. Current equals to do dot pop it. If current dot is checked is true, then we can print out going back to whatever the current clearing happens to be and then we're done. So in this case, stop the loop. Okay, and after we've popped it, the good thing to do is immediately do a save dot push of current there to remember it. Pop it, remember it, check it, and keep going. And when we're done the while loop, have to put everything back. So another while loop, while, well that should be uh, not save.size, that should be to-do.size. This is while saved.size is greater than zero. We'll do a uh, clearing temp is save.pop it, and then do a to do dot push of the temp to put it back the way it was. Okay, so this is try to wipe it out to find the one you want 
and then the next loop is oh let's put them all back the way they were okay, let's give that a try and see what happens so it does 0, 3, 9, going back to 3, then current is 8, then going back to 3, back to 0, uh, current is 2, current is 7, back to 2, back to 0. Yeehaw. Works just fine. Okay. So now we've got it reporting where it is along the way. The other thing I want to do is when I'm done, I want to report how to get to the beer starting from here, starting from the house where everybody's waiting. So I want the path going in that direction. So when you're done, down here outside of the loop we're going to print path to beer and the only information we need is the to-do list in order to accomplish that That's going to be a stack of clearing to do. How are you going to print the path to the beer? You can pretty much just use the code that you used in print going back to. You could do going back to, or what about our friend the iterator in this case? what direction do you think it's going to go? It's going to go hopefully from the zero. beginning, the zero position forwards. So let's for fun just try the iterator. So that's for clearing, a clearing in the to-do list. System out, print line. Uh, let's just print out the numbers. And let's put a uh, print statement here. So we'll print out the path to the beer. Let's do um, a clearing plus, yeah, not quite right, but what the heck. That might work. And we'll run it, and we'll see what we get. That's all of the ones that are on the stack. We only want if they've, been if they've been checked. If a clearing dot, uh, sorry, is checked is true, then we'll print that. Otherwise, we'll do nothing. Give that a try. Path the beer is zero one six eleven. There's the beer. Yeah, solves the problem. Now, in official computer science terms, this is referred to as backtracking. 
because the name of the game is to record all of the stuff you haven't done yet and then work your way backwards through it. Anybody see another application of this? Anybody play computer checkers? When you play checkers against a computer, you start out and there's a possibility of eight different moves that you can make with the first checker. And you can then put the stack with all of those eight moves, eight possible moves on it, which results in your opponent making one of eight other possible moves that need to be checked. Right. And so you can go through each set of moves trying to figure out which move works best for you. How do you figure out what's best in checkers? Best at any point in time is probably got something to do with how many checkers do I have versus you? Uh, how many uh, things am I attacking? that I could take of your pieces versus you? How many spots are my checkers uh, defending or preventing you from moving to? So you could come up with a, a goodness number for every sort of situation on the board that said, well, if the board looked like this and I added up all of my goodness number and I had a high goodness number and the other guy had a low goodness number for the, the number of pieces he had, et cetera, then the biggest that I can find between the high and the low for any one of those possibilities is probably the best one I want to take. So even if you haven't looked all the way into the future, you can figure out what the best possibility is. Oh, by the way, the tic-tac-toe games work exactly the same because there's a limited number of possibilities that you can do in tic-tac-toe. In checkers, you have to stop at some point because you can't generate all of the possibilities because there's just too many of them. Okay, so we've got tic-tac-toe uses that strategy, uh, checkers uses that strategy. If you played a chess game, a chess game on the computer uses exactly the same strategy to do that, only it's just slightly more complicated because there's different pieces that can move uh, different ways and calculating the goodness factor of the board is a little more difficult. So people come up with different algorithms for what's the goodness factor. They assign points to all of the pieces. They assign points to how many places am I attacking. And you just basically come up with a number that says, if I were to look at that board, I would say it's either good or bad based on these factors. And then you generate a set of possibilities. And then when time runs out, you just go, OK, this is the best possibility I've found so far of all of the things that I could do with my first move, second move, third move, as far as I get into the future. And then you pick that one and go, well, we'll just head off in that direction. So the code is really not much more difficult than that. Okay, In order to do the basics, it's the calculating the board positions of getting the pieces to move. In the 1970s, the people at Bell Labs started uh, uh, playing computer chess. Uh, they used to have chess tournaments of computer against computer that were really, really famous. And uh, they discovered that making these moves was really slow on the current computers. What they did was they actually made a piece of electronic hardware whose job it was to generate all of the possible moves at any point because the electronics worked faster than being able to try to do it with the CPU. And so they had this external gadget that did nothing but spit out move possibilities that the thing could check. So if you go and you look at the history of, of Bell Labs had a computer program, program called Bell, P-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. The first versions of it were done with the hardware move checker. Now it's gotten, the computers have gotten fast enough that, that uh, chess games are practically unbeatable for normal human beings just because they can calculate so many moves into the future and decide on the goodness factor. Okay. But all basically that same technique. And with that, we're off to the lab, some of us.